Hello and welcome back to Russ's Movie Corner. My name is Russ and as you can see I am sitting in front of my movie corner. I have my Armor of God t-shirt on, my King of Kings movie right next to me, and judging by the frame around me we are back taking down another atheist. Today on the chopping block is of course Simon Dan, whom I also call Scam Man Dan because he doesn't really give any evidence. Um, so on the last episode, um, we were um, discussing this video that uh, that Simon Dan um, was reacting to by Standing for Truth. Um, Donnie, of course, is a Christian who um, does like debates on his channel. He does live streams. He does um, like podcasts, that kind of stuff. Um, he's a really neat guy. Um, and so Simon Dan really kind of spent um, a lot of the first part of this video just kind of mealy mouthing a whole bunch of stuff and when we last left off um he was talking about the um they, they were talking about how genetically humans um the guy that that donnie had on his video was talking about how humans had been genetically bottlenecked into um like basically there was just a little amount of people and then from that has come all of us on the planet, okay? And then, of course, he said, oh, of course, you'd have to believe in mass incest. And it's like, well, it wasn't incest back then because you would have been genetically similar. I also mentioned that um, in case you didn't know, for most people really don't, um... Now, there was a famine in the land. This is um, Genesis chapter 12, verse 10. Um, it says, Now there was a famine in the land, so Abram went down to Egypt to sojourn there, for the famine was severe in the land. When he was about to enter Egypt, he said to Sarai, his wife, I know that you are a, wo a woman beautiful in appearance. And when these Egyptians see you, they will say, This is his wife. Then they will kill me, but they will let you live. Say you are my sister, that it may go well with me because of you, that my life may be spared for your sake. When Abram entered Egypt, the Egyptians saw that the woman was very beautiful. And when the princes of Pharaoh saw her, they praised her to Pharaoh, and the woman was taken into Pharaoh's house. And for her sake, he dealt with her. Um, he dealt well with Abram, and he had sheep, oxen, male donkeys, male servants, female servants, female donkeys, and camels. But the Lord afflicted Pharaoh and his house with a great plagues because of Sarai, Abram's wife. So Pharaoh called Abram and said, What is this you have done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister, so that I took her for my wife? Now then, here is your wife, take her and go. And Pharaoh gave men orders concerning him, and they sent him away with his wife and all that he had. Here's the thing. Okay. Abram married Sarai. Okay. Um, who was like his half-sister. So, he didn't lie to the Pharaoh, okay? Because technically, she was his sister, okay? Um, the, the thing is, is that most people don't understand that until a certain point, okay, until genetics became necessary to diverge, there was no law against incest. There wasn't. There wasn't a law against incest until you get to in either Exodus or Leviticus where the covenant basically says after that you know don't have sex with you know your wife your or don't have sex with your with your sister your mother you know fathers with their daughters mothers with their sons, with, you know, cousins, with this, with that. Because the problem is, is that with the amount of mutations that we have right now that are, that are detrimental, because we've never clocked a beneficial mutation. We've only ever clocked neutral or negative mutations. The mutations that happen when you marry somebody that is very genetically similar, okay, or when you mate with somebody that's very genetically similar, that's when you have problems. 
Okay. And so, I mean, like, even Darwin himself, okay, like, married, like, a cousin, I think it was. Um, and because he thought that he wanted somebody pure. Okay, he wanted he wanted to have his genetics be more pure, and his kids ended up coming out very, very, very wrong. Okay, so <clears throat> with with this statement of oh, you know, to believe that you'd have to believe in mass incest. Yeah, it was an incest back then. Okay, because there was no one else to marry. That was who you had to marry. But the thing is is that as the tribes moved away from each other, because as the, as the population grew, and then the Tower of Babel happened, and God confused the languages and scattered the people, because he told them, go scatter, you know, spread over all the earth. They didn't. They stayed and built a big tower. And so God was like, all right, fine, bam. Confuses all the languages and then sends them out. Now, funny thing about that. Every single language on earth has a similar root structure. Not the same, but similar. Okay? Which means that at some point in the past, everybody spoke one language. And then from that, other languages evolved. We've since totally forgotten that language. But the language that I speak comes from other languages. Okay? I speak English which has its roots in Latin and Greek, okay, with heavy influences from German and um, French, okay, and now Spanish, because, you know, we've had a lot of people come to, um, come to America from Spanish-speaking countries, okay, and so that lexicon has kind of worked its way into English as well. So, the thing about English, the thing about all of the languages on the earth, they all have a root, okay? And where that root is, okay, if you talk to actual linguists, they will say that at some point all of the languages were one, and then they diverged, which fits with the Bible, okay? So this is something that Simon Dan doesn't want to talk about, and he's not going to mention it, okay? He's just going to call this a fairy tale. So let's jump back in, and we'll go from there. Is that again, male and females were being decided before these two individuals? No, no, they weren't. Unless you're saying that when God created everything, did He create animals, male and female? Yes. But what advantages do males and females have in the natural order? There's only one. Procreation. Okay. And he wants to say that there's some kind of thing that it's like, oh, see, we know that, that you know, that males and females developed. Did they? Because bacteria don't reproduce like that, son. Amoebas don't reproduce like that. They're not, they're not male and female. They're asexual because they're single-celled organisms. So how would a single-celled organism decided one day, you know what would be really cool? Sex. How does that work? A bacteria can't think like that. A bacteria can't go, you know, I wonder if I was like something and that other bacteria was something else, and we could mate together and mix our genetic code. It doesn't work like that. They just... Whoosh, mitosis, man. That's all they do. That's how they reproduce. They literally just copy their genetic code and then split apart. Like any other cell in your body. Okay? These cells in my arm, in my face in my body, they don't know the difference. These individual cells don't know that I'm male or female outside of the chromosomes defining that characteristic. 
the only outward appearance of that is the fact that as a man typically okay we don't have mammary glands and our sex organs are external females your sex organs are internal and you have mammary glands okay I'm not talking about hair I'm not talking about anything else and there's a little bit of bone structure there too but the point is is that your individual cell like my cell that creates this arm hair okay doesn't differentiate it doesn't know it's just doing what the G what the DNA is telling it to do okay and because I'm a man this hair grows thicker and longer than it would on a female okay I also grow facial hair you probably see I got like a little five o'clock shadow okay because I haven't shaved in a couple days but basically that's the point okay is that as a man as a male I have certain things that happen okay now hold that thought I'll be back in a minute and we're back sorry about that I had a personal issue to attend to and so I had some things going on and I needed to take care of so um, when I left off um, we had just talked about how si Simon Dan was talking about how things were like naturalistically heading towards male and female long before we had a uh, one set male and one set female okay and I was trying to say okay then how does that work because outside of my chromosomes that make me who I am my DNA in here doesn't like doesn't say like you're a male or you're a female okay like if I were to just take you know one skin cell and then try to clone myself from that does that DNA know that it's male or female and the only way that we know male from female is chromosomes XX versus XY Okay, XX is female, XY is male. So that's basically how that works, okay? And so it's up to Scam Man Dan here to explain how a single-celled organism that doesn't reproduce the way that we reproduce, how would it know what male and female is? How would it have known when it suddenly and as if by magic became some kind of a multicellular organism how would it have known oh I, I need to have a male sex organ and then that has to have a female sex organ so that we can mate that doesn't make any sense okay in a naturalistic sense but in the Bible when God created all of the animals, of course he created them male and female. I mean, why wouldn't he? Right? So let's jump back in here. And some species as well actually use temperature now in today's day and age to decide whether or not a baby is going to be male or female. Plus, the Y chromosome evolved around 300,000 years ago, which is way, 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 way older than 6,000 years. Mm, but how do you know that it did that 300,000 years ago? See, that's the problem. They're looking at the layers in the dirt and they're going, well, see, this is 300,000 years ago according to our geologic column that we created. So this is 300,000 years and see, here's some DNA that we can look at that says that it's X X X Y 
But how do you know that that is 300,000 years old? Because it's in this layer. Well, how do you know that layer is 300,000 years old? Well, because it has this fossil in it. That's the circular reasoning they're using. You don't know that, Dan. You're assuming it's 300,000 years old. When in actuality, it is only 6,000 years old. Because all of those fossils that you find in the dirt, guess where they came from? Noah's Flood. The thing that you don't want to believe in. Now, before you say, well, that sounds like the Flood. They don't get excited. This isn't the Genesis Flood and the cute Ark story. Um, because this happened further back in history and blah, blah, blah. Well, why would they even say that? The reason they say that is when you look at the genetics of everyone on the planet, it should be very widespread if we've been evolving for at least six million years from an ape-like creature. Yep. But when they examine it, it's very narrowly focused. So they said rescuing device. Okay, <laughs> what happened was it did spread out over millions of years, but then a catastrophic event occurred where almost everyone died out and a small population survived to then start repopulating the Earth and that wasn't too long ago, so it hasn't widened out very far. By the way, Jay... So basically, what Jay Sigurd is saying there is, is that how they're reconciling the story, or basically how they're retconning their own crap, is they're saying, okay, so we've had this thing where, it, like, we had this really, really wide genetic diversity, and then we had an extinction-level event that brought it down to just a few people, and now it's spreading back out again. Okay. Or we were created 6,000 years ago and 4,400 years ago there was a flood. And only eight people survived. Because there was Noah, his wife, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their wives. Okay, so that's where Jay is coming from, is that he's saying that these guys, these scientists are out there saying, well, okay, see, there was all this diversity, and then all of a sudden there was a big extinction level event that like bottlenecked everything, and then now it's starting to widen back out again, and then yet you don't want to believe that there was a widespread flood, global flood. You know, so they're going to say, oh, well, it was probably like something else. It comes back to there and somehow and as if by magic, miraculously something survived. That's not how it works. Okay. Our world was shaped by the flood. Our modern world was shaped by the flood, okay? Because why is it that the oldest desert on Earth, if, if we're supposedly billions of years old, why is the oldest desert on Earth 4,300 years old? The one that's right behind Dan's head there, right behind Dan's head, okay? That's the oldest desert, okay? Covers... This whole area of North Africa and this area right up in here, okay? Why is it that this desert here is only 4,300 years old? You ever ask yourself that question? Hmm? Probably because there was a global flood. Otherwise, that desert would be a lot larger. Okay? But it's not. There was a flood. And before that, there was a lot more plants and animals and stuff. And, and here's the biggest thing. Why is this region, which is a desert, by the way, this region right here, why is this region, okay, of the Middle East, right here, so full of oil, 
Do you ever ask yourself that question? Why is it that the biggest desert, okay, that covers this Arabian Peninsula, so rich in oil? Because what is oil? Biomass, right? What is biomass? Organic material, like plants, trees, stuff like that. How did that form? Doesn't take millions of years. I mean, they can do it in a lab now in a matter of hours. So we know it doesn't take millions of years to make coal and oil deposits because we can do it in a lab. I mean, hell, we've taken pieces of like graphite and like carbon and we've squeezed them down into lab grown diamonds. And they'll say, oh, we do in, you know, a few hours what takes nature millions of years to do. No, it didn't take nature millions of years to do it. If it doesn't take you millions of years, how, how come nature all of a sudden takes millions of years? Isn't nature have a lot more processes than that? Why are they still digging diamonds out of Africa? Shouldn't they have run out by now? But they still keep getting diamonds out of it. Why? Probably because they're still forming. At the same rate that they're being taken out, they're forming. Think about it. Seeger, the speaker here, has a degree in physics and engineering. He's not at all qualified in evolutionary biology. And you are? You're not. So what makes you suddenly qualified to try to debunk him? You see, this is the appeal to authority fallacy. Okay? People like him will say, well, see, we have to listen to Neil deGrasse Tyson. Is Neil deGrasse Tyson a, a biologist? Evolutionary biologist? No. No. Is Bill Nye? No, Bill Nye has a mechanical engineering degree. The same degree as Jay Siegert does. What makes them unqualified to speak about it? You see, this is the appeal to authority fallacy. This is what they do all the time. Well, you don't have a degree in that, so you're not qualified to talk about it. Why not? Anyone who learns just even the basics of evolution can talk about evolution. You don't have to have a degree, some kind of piece of paper behind your name to talk about evolutionary biology. This is the fallacy that we're going to get into when I finally get into my um, the, the video that um, Creaky Blinder did on me. Okay? Because, like, one of the first things that he's going to play in his video is me saying, I'm not a scientist. But then I went on to say, just because I don't have the piece of paper behind my name doesn't necessarily mean that I can't talk about this stuff. Because I studied geology. I studied biology. I've studied chemistry. I've studied physics. Practically. Okay, done things in labs, okay, worked in settings where I've had to use those things in practical application purposes, been out in the field doing geology things. Does that now suddenly disqualify me from talking about things because I don't have some magical piece of paper behind my name that says that I spent, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars to study this stuff? No. Dave Farina has an organic chemistry background but even then he doesn't know a lot about the, the the theory of evolution 
because that's not his area of study. He's not an evolutionary biologist. And according to Scam Man Dan here, he shouldn't even be allowed to speak on evolution. Does Scam Man Dan have an evolutionary biology degree? No? Oh, well then he shouldn't be allowed to talk about it either. You see the slippery slope that we start to get into when you use the appeal to authority fallacy? Suddenly, nobody in the world is qualified except somebody that has a piece of paper behind their name that says, like, PhD, Evolutionary Biology, or Bachelors of Science, Evolutionary Biology. That is absolutely pathetic. And I'm sorry to say that Dan here has no idea what he's talking about half the time. Because he's just spinning his wheels trying to think, oh, I'm just better than everybody else. Because I believe in science! Exclamation point trademarked. Son, don't think you're special. Okay? Just because somebody has a degree in something other than evolutionary biology doesn't necessarily mean that he hasn't studied. This is the exact same thing that Dave Farina tried to pull on James Tour in his debate with James Tour. James, you don't know anything. You don't know you don't know what you're talking about. Oh, you've never read the papers. You've never How does Dave Farina know that that James Tour has never read the papers? Hmm? How does Dave Farina know that the audience that James Tour is talking about weren't regulars in James Tour's classroom learning the very same things that Dave Farina and James Tour are debating? Hmm? He runs on the assumption that everybody but him are the dumbest people on earth because uh, you just don't believe what I believe, so you're all dumb. And that's exactly what he's doing. He's going, oh, Jay Seeger doesn't have a degree in evolutionary biology. He's a physicist and, and mechanical engineer. He doesn't know what he's talking about. How do you know that he doesn't know what he's talking about, son? Hmm? Maybe you don't know what you're talking about, Dan. You ever thought of that? Maybe you're wrong, and he's right. How do you know? That's the point. But neither am I, of course. However, when I reference things like this paper, Perspectives on Human Variation Through the Lens of Diversity and Race, and it says, and I quote, the diverse human populations... <clears throat> Dan, it's going to take more than quoting one paper, okay, to under stand what's going on because if you read the whole paper not just the one part that he's looking at it says human populations however defined differ in the distribution and frequency of traits they display and diseases to which individuals are susceptible these need to be understood with respect to three recent advances first these differences are multi-causal and, and a result of um, not only genetic, but also epigenetic and environmental factors, i.e. where you live, like certain populations because their water isn't clean they're more susceptible to certain diseases like malaria and you know parasites and that kind of stuff um second the actions of genes although crucial turns out to be quite dynamic and modifiable which contrasts with the classical view that they are inflexible machines third the diverse human population across the globe have spent too little time apart from our um, common origin 50,000 years ago to have developed many individually adapted traits. Human trait and disease differences by continental ancestry um, are, there, um, 
are thus as much as the or just as much basically the result of um, non-genetic as genetic forces. Okay. And then it says in the next sentence it says humans across the globe display variations um, in numerous different traits, but these differences are caused by both genetic and non-genetic factors and do not define distinct races in biological terms because like for instance across asia okay you have like what we would call asians okay people that live in china korea um oriental folk okay what we commonly call the orient okay in the far east talking china japan korea Indonesia, those places, Mongolia to a certain extent, but then across the continent, across the southern regions of like Pakistan, because you also have Indians that live in India, okay, you know, the Hindus and all those people that live in that, in that area, right, you also have a whole bunch of people that are Muslims, Pakistanis, um, Afghans, those type of people that are not classically Asian like China, that, or Indian, okay? So you have a diverse range of people, but within those different groups, okay, it's not necessarily like some of the diseases that those people suffer some of the genetic traits that they have, some of the traits that are there, cut across all those barriers. So even though we could consider them to be different races, in terms of we have, you know, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, typically Asian people, we have Indian people in India, and we have all of the Muslims across the the that lower part of of um Russia there in Pakistan and, and Afghanistan and all the stands across there you have certain things that cut across those barriers traits that those people share that are not necessarily genetic and they say that in that paragraph and you'll notice how he's cutting out just the one part that says from our common origin 50,000 years ago because it fits his narrative of us being older than 6,000 years. But how do these people know that we're that our race of the human race is 50,000 years old? They don't. Because again, they have bones in the dirt and lines on paper and that's it. This paper is assuming that that's what's going on. Okay? But Dr. Norm Jeanson of Answers in Genesis can trace the Y chromosome back to three individuals off of Noah's Ark. Every single Y chromosome that the human race shares can be traced back to three people off of Noah's Ark. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Kind of lends credence to the Bible more than this paper ever would. Okay? Because the thing about this paper is even though it's called Perspectives on Human Variation Through the Lens of Diversity and Race, it's saying that things are not always just about our diversity and race because there are certain factors certain traits certain things that go beyond the typical race that we would use to define different human beings because beyond just the typical phenotypical look of people there are certain things that cut across those type of barriers. Okay? Because it's here. It's 
It's where you live. Okay? It's also who, who you mate with. Okay? Because you could have recessive genes, and your partner could have recessive genes, and when you meet, those recessive genes could become dominant. So it's not just it's not just this one little tiny sentence up here across the globe have spent too little time apart from our common origin 50,000 years ago to have developed many individually adapted So, one of the other things that they said here, okay, and, and this is their paper quoting it, not me, it says, half-jokingly, Gwen Ifill, the noted American journalist and newscaster, told the Smithsonian audience, in no universe is President Obama white, Smithsonian National Museum of Natural History 2013. Her comment came in response to this person, okay, this Aravanda Chakravarti, Chazervarti, whatever his name is, up here, Okay, it says that the, the journalist's comment came in response to my genetic argument that given the president's white American mother and Kenyan father, he could just as well be called white as black. Because where does he come from? Well, he's half and half, right? Because his father's a Kenyan, his mother's a, a white woman, okay, now Caucasian woman. Okay, they mated and out popped Obama. Okay, fine. I knew guys in my in high school, when I went to high school, I knew two guys that were twins, okay, that had a black father, white mother, okay, and they got their muscle structure from their dad. Okay? Because they were fast. Just just like most black athletes are. Okay? They had they had that fast twitch, those type of muscles. I mean they were quick. But they inherited their Caucasian mother's skin color. So to look at them. They, they weren't like Barack Obama was, okay? Where they had that mix. They were white, like this, okay? It's just how the genetic dice are rolled, folks. I'm not saying that as a, as a knock against them or anything, because they were awesome people, and um, they were great. And, I mean... They were they were really awesome guys, and and I knew them for a few years until they, until they graduated out of high school, and um, I think I I think we I think we graduated at the same time. Basically, like I knew them, and I never knew what happened to them. Never looked them up on Facebook or nothing like that. But um, but basically, like, I, and I'm not saying this to be like, oh my gosh, you know these guys are doing it. I'm not saying it in any way. I'm talking about this, okay. <laughs> Because in the genetic lottery, okay, if you've ever looked at Punnett squares, okay, and I'm not talking about the basic four that you do, like you know you got you got the Punnett squares that look like that, right? And then you you cut them you cut them into four, and then you put like you know big A, little A, like big B, little B. And then you and then you drop them down into the squares, and then you look at what what the difference. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the big ones, where you've got like, you know, ten across, ten down, okay, and you're doing all these different variations, because that's what actually happens when your cells undergo meiosis, okay, when your sex cells divide. That's what happens. It's not just a simple little four opponent square. Oh, here's this, here's this. No, it's like 
all of those genes divide. Okay? And some of them go into certain sex cells and others go into other sex cells. So you get recessive traits, you get dominant traits, you get mix of traits. Okay? And so when you're mom and dad or when you and your partner mate okay those cells mix together and it creates you or your child okay so when your mom and dad had sex and had you okay when you popped out you're the sum of that one sperm cell from your father and that one egg cell from your mom and those traits those inherited traits come from both your mom and your dad but there are also certain things that happen to you that come from your environment okay that's the point Okay, which is why eugenics is so bad because what eugenics tries to do is it tries to weed out the weakness and only take the dominant but in doing so it ends up creating something that is not quite human okay and they've been trying for many many years okay And it's something that we should not ever entertain. Okay? All right, let's go a little bit longer here. Traits. Human traits and disease differences by continental ancestry are thus as much the result of non-genetic as genetic forces. Let's be clear here. Modern Homo sapiens have only been around for around 150,000 years. You assume, Dan, you assume they've been around for 150 thousand years because you don't know you're assuming because you looked in some layers and you went oh see this one's about 150,000 years and and here's a you know here's a, a a thing that we can say or you know like we carbon dated some bones fragments that we found and we we tried to to guess based on that because well we we don't actually know because they don't they're basing this on the geologic column and bones that they found in different ways that have all turned out to be hoaxes. But they still put them in textbooks and they still teach them. So that is an incredibly small amount of time when referring to evolutionary timescales. According to you because you think that it takes billions of years for things to adapt and change yet we have never ever ever observed any of those other changes taking place other than within the certain kinds and so it has to be asked how many generations and variations does it take until something changes you'll notice they never answer that question because they know that the numbers don't add up. Because if they said, oh, it takes, you know, uh, 150,000 generations, they can't prove that. If they said it took 10,000 generations, well, sorry, we've already passed that mark. Especially in bacteria. Shouldn't the bacteria have become something other than bacteria by now? but they don't and then they'll say well there hasn't been enough time oh really so you're saying that it takes 10,000 ge generations yet bacteria go through that in about a hundred years and the same bacteria that we had a hundred years ago are still around today how does that work you see what I'm saying this is the problem with evolution they're lying to you because they don't know.
and everything outside of that sphere of what we do know is a religious belief. That whole paper about us being 50,000 years old and, <coughs> and looking at all these different variations and all that kind of stuff, that's all a religious belief. <coughs> because they can't go back 50,000 years. It's not like they have a special magic scope that they can look through like this and go, oh, see, we can see back 50,000 years in time and we can see our ancestors and we can, <coughs> and we can know because we can observe them. Ah, sorry, <clears throat> I had a little catch in my throat. <clears> throat. That's the point. Okay? It doesn't work like that. What's interesting is that's the genetics of people. Then he said, let's take a look at the genetics of animals. They came to the same conclusion. It seems like almost every animal on the planet today <laughs> was almost wiped out in the past. A small group survived to repopulate about the same same time that people were repopulating the planet. Well, surprise, I have a talk that's called Surprise. The Bible explains that, and that's one of them. That the Bible <laughs> yeah. explains why they're seeing that, because there was a biblical flood where you had eight people survive, six of which repopulated the planet. And from what I've read, it seems like you can also divide up genetics of people across the planet into three major categories which had yeah, three couples coming off the ark so maybe that accounts for that there we go ladies and gentlemen a grown man suggesting that six people just six people are responsible for the entire human race yet you're saying that the entirety of every single animal and plant on the planet came from some bacteria-like common ancestor? And that's supposed to be less ludicrous than six people off of Noah's Ark repopulating the planet? I'm sorry, did I miss something here? Because, like, I think we got our fairy tales crossed. Because yours is sounding way more like a fairy tale than mine. Because at least I have an explanation for why <coughs> every single Y chromosome on the planet goes back to three people off of Noah's Ark, three men off of Noah's Ark, and then goes back to one man. And all of the mitochondria that's in your DNA goes back to one woman. Sorry, one man, one woman. Oh, Adam and Eve. And what did the scientific community call the one woman? Oh, that's right. Mitochondrial Eve. Yeah, they actually called her that. And what do they call the Y chromosome man? Y chromosome Adam. Gee, it's almost like the scientific community believes in the Adam and Eve story. They just don't want to believe in this version of it. But it's almost like they believe in it. But see, here's the thing. To believe in Dan's theory here, okay, what do you have to believe in? That somehow, and as if by magic, two bacteria okay or bacterium of some kind okay slowly evolved somehow and as if by magic survived seven or eight extinction level events throughout the planet's history started changing getting to become multicellular organisms somehow and as if by magic and somehow, and as if by magic, they started developing sex characteristics independent of each other. And somehow, and as if by magic, they decided to mate. And they found that this created some new thing. And then somehow, and as if by magic, that became something else. 
And then that became something else. And then that became something else. And somehow, and as if by magic, a man and a woman showed up in the continent of Africa somewhere at the same time and were able to mate and create Homo sapiens. That's their worldview, folks. And they call us the crazy ones for believing that a creative being outside of time and space and matter created the universe that we live in, created all the animals, created all the plants, created everything, including men and women, in six days, 6,000 years ago. And this isn't somehow and as if by magic this has an agent. The agent isn't, oh, long ago and far away. It's a creator God who loves us enough to send his son to die for us. Because we, the humans, fucked it. Now, which sounds more believable? The up. incest alone must have been positively biblical. That sentence alone, by the way, tells me he's talking nonsense. No, Dan. The one talking nonsense here is you. Because again, incest wasn't a penalty under the Bible until years later after Moses freed the Israelites. Because again... And here's the difference between actual biblical scholars who understand the context and atheists like Dan who don't know anything about the Bible and just pop off at the mouth because they don't know any better. Okay? <clears throat> if you add up the dates, okay, about 4,400 years ago, okay, was Genesis 6, okay? And then, in Genesis chapter 9, that's when Noah comes off the ark and God makes the covenant with them, okay? Kind of the end of chapter 8, beginning of chapter 9, okay? They come out of the ark and they have the whole earth to themselves, okay? And then it says that they started doing that and then all the nations that they have and all that kind of stuff. Now, here's the thing. If we were to add up Shem's descendants, okay? If we add up the dates down to Abraham, okay, you've got probably a good thousand years of time, okay? 500 years at least. I mean, because Shem lived 500 years, had other sons and daughters. Arfakshad lived um, 403 after he lived 35, so he lived 438. When Shela lived 30, he fathered Eber. Then he lived another 403 years. He had Peleg after Eber was 34, so he was 464 when he died. And Peleg lived 30, he fathered Ryu. Peleg lived after father after he fathered Ryu, 209. So he was 239. You'll notice that things start to get a little bit drastically, like instead of living 500 years or 400 years, they started living 200 years, then they started living 100 years. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> from there down to Abram, and, and I don't have a chart in front of me. Okay, but you can find charts online that show this stuff. And basically, what ends up happening is is that you you end up with a with a timeline basically. Okay, and then if you look at Abram, he lived what was it, 135 years? I'm trying to remember. Let me see here. Um.
Okay. So Abraham lived 175 years. So if we had, let's say, let's give a conservative estimate of 900 years between Shem and Abram. So 900 years, then another 175, okay? So that's 1,075 years, okay? Isaac... Um, let me see here. Remember... Let me see here. Isaac. Um, where's 180? So add that on to the 75. So that would be, what, 175 and then plus another, um, let me see, another... 25 years off of the 80 would give us 200. So that would already be at 1,300 years plus another 55. So we'd be at 255. So we'd be at 1,355 after Shem. And then Jacob... Um, let me see here. So we were at thirteen fifty five. see here um it doesn't sorry 40 days are required for it for 70 days weeping for him um, It says how much Jacob lived right off the top of my head. Um, yeah, it's fine. <clears throat> but he was like, I don't know, 85 when he entered. Um, Jacob met um, Jacob met Pharaoh basically like um, yeah Pharaoh said to Jacob how many are the days and the years of your life and Jacob said to Pharaoh the days and the years of my sojourning are a hundred and thirty Few and evil have been the days and the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days and the years of the life of my fathers, and in the days of their sojourning. Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out from the presence of Pharaoh. So he was 130, and let's assume he lived another 20. So let's say he lived 150. Just round number, it's what I'm guessing. So if he lived 150 years... Because it doesn't say how long they were in Egypt before he passed. Okay. So. So 100, 150 years, let's say. Okay. So on to the 1355 that we have. If we add another 150, we end up at... Um, what about 1500 
thereabouts. Okay. Then there was 400 years of slavery in Egypt. Okay. In the beginning of Exodus. Before Moses was born, then he lived uh, 50 years and then came back and freed them. So we have another 450 years on top of this. So 1950 years pass, okay, before the Lord even comes in and says incest is wrong. So how many generations and variations and genetic differences can you get in 1950 years, son? Think about it for a minute. And that's on the conservative side, because again, I don't have a chart in front of me, and I'm not sitting there going, okay, it was this many years. Okay? Like, I'm not sitting there and going, okay, here's the timeline, and it's been this many years, and here's how much it is. Right? So, for him to sit there and be like, oh, that's, that's a lot of incest of biblical proportions. Incest wasn't wrong at the time. Because it wasn't mandated until almost 2,000 years after the flood in the time of Moses. Because at the time, the genetic similarities would have been such that it wouldn't have been a problem for someone to marry a sister or a cousin, okay, it, it wouldn't have been that big of a deal. But by the time of Moses, 2,000 years later, the genetic differences got such that they were like, don't do that. Because now you're going to start having problems because of negative mutations, because our DNA has degraded over the variations and generations. That's what Jay Siegert is talking about, okay? Is he saying that if we take it back, it, 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 it all points back to three people off of Noah's Ark. That is a guaranteed fact. It is a scientific fact now, okay, that that happened. That the male Y chromosome can be traced back to three individuals. Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Sorry. That's just how it is. Let's finish this. We only got less than three minutes. And, I mean, he's probably going to be done about, you know... He's probably going to be done in about a minute and a half anyway. So let's just finish up. Now, according to the IUCN, to retain evolutionary potential to remain genetically flexible and diverse, the IUCN criteria suggests we would need at least 500 effective individuals. That's using today's genetic code, by the way. That's what they won't tell you. That's using the genetic code of today. <laughs> because they're talking about if we have a nuclear apocalypse today, or some kind of an apocalypse, we have an asteroid strike that wipes out, you know, 90% of the population on the Earth, or maybe 95% of the population on the Earth, even then, we would still have enough to rebuild after the apocalypse. That's the point today, son! That has nothing to do with what happened during biblical times. Because their genetic code would have been supremely superior to ours. Because of the degradation of the genetic code until now, that's what they're doing, okay? So they're saying, basically, if there was only 50 people left on the Earth, okay? If there was only 50 people left on the Earth, okay? Then that means that, you know, 
if you have 50 effective individuals, that would be 25. And if they had two kids or maybe five kids or 10 kids, that gives you a total population of 250 to 500. This means that in a hypothetical apocalypse, like a nuclear apocalypse or meteorite strike or something like that, humanity would need a lot more than a handful of survivors to repopulate effectively. To retain, quote, evolutionary potential to remain genetically flexible and diverse, the IUCN criteria would suggest that we need at least 500 effective individuals that requires a population of 2,500 to 5,000. Now. That's now, son. That's not then. <laughs> I love how these idiots do this. Like, how would... If you had one Homo sapiens, or two Homo sapiens, okay, you had, you had mitochondrial Eve, you had Y chromosome Adam, on the continent of Africa at the same time, how would they have populated... Homo sapiens on the earth. Wait for it. Would they have mated with Homo neanderthalus? Would they have mated with Homo erectus? No. What would they have done? They would have mated with each other. And then their kids would have mated with each other. And then their kids would have mated with each other. And then their kids would have mated with each other. And, with each other, and that's how they would have populated the earth. Son. Gee, just like the Bible says. Because it says that Adam and Eve had many sons and daughters after Adam lived. And it says that Shem, Ham, and Japheth had many sons and daughters after they begat a certain one. This is now. This is now. Okay? Because inbreeding now, because our DNA is so bad and so polluted... That yes, to have a rebuilt world after the apocalypse, we would need to have 500 effective individuals, which means we have 25 or 250 couples. Okay, that's what they mean by effective individuals. They mean you know 500 male and female that will mate. Okay, so that's 250 effective couples that would have anywhere between two and ten children each to be able to rebuild the earth and have the same genetic diversity that we have today to remain that genetically diverse that's what they're talking about today son you can't take our dna today and put it back that many generations we're talking 4,400 years worth of genetic diversity here. Okay? You can't take that much genetic diversity in 4,400 years and say that, oh, you had to have this many people. No, you didn't. Not then. Because their, their genetic code would have been vastly superior to our own. You absolute freaking moron. This is the worst thing I've ever seen anyone post. That they're using our own DNA today, where the Bible has already proscripted that we shouldn't be inbreeding, to, to say that the three individuals off of Noah's Ark could never have populated the earth this way. Why not? Your own model would have predicted that. Because if you had mitochondrial Eve and Y chromosome Adam at the same time on the continent of Africa, they wouldn't have been inbreeding with other apes or with Homo erectus or Homo neanderthalus if they ever even existed, which they didn't because they're identical to humans. They, they never would have bred with them. They would have bred with themselves and then they would have had their kids breed. So then... How would that be any different than what this says? Son, you guys are prescripting the Bible. You're just extending out the time period. It is absolutely asinine 
And it is so hypocritical. <laughs> now that would require a population of between two and a half thousand and five thousand. Amen. Amen. So many great points that everybody needs to hear. Some of the most amazing evidence for uh, biblical creation. Uh, Jay, actually one of my favorite topics, so I'm really glad that, that you brought that up. It's such powerful evidence for our position. It is. And no surprise to the biblical creationists. I mean, the Bible says God created two people, Adam and Eve. Right Adam off the bat, that restricts what? Genetic diversity. Today, humans have low genetic diversity. As you pointed out, every single human being, we're about 99.999% the same. There should be a, a much higher levels of genetic diversity if, again, as you pointed out, we've been evolving for millions of years from the Australopithecines to Habilis to Erectus to Homo sapiens. And what do they do? A rescue device, a, a hypothetical out of Africa population bottleneck, some near extinction event that we have no evidence for at all, really. Really? Actually, we do have evidence for a near extinction, near extinction level event. But they don't want to admit that it's a near extinction level event that happened at that time. So what they do is, is they go out and then they, they make something up. So here's what they made up. You claim there's no evidence for that, but then claim that six people hopped off the ark at the end and were responsible for seven billion people. No. No, that's not what we're saying. We're saying you. You. The atheists and the scientific community, trademark, don't have anything remotely resembling an extinction level event like we do. This tells us of an extinction level event that wiped out 99.9% .9 of all humans and animals and plant life on the planet an actual recorded event that ironically enough is backed up by cultures all over the world and yet you guys want to believe that it never happened and then you call us crazy for saying that people hopped off an ark and repopulated the earth from Six people, well, eight if you count Noah and his wife, but the six, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their wives, to seven billion, 4,400 years later. And it's funny to me that they can't even see that, like, we have had brand new species of dogs almost every single year for the past, like, two centuries. Since people started actually breeding dogs, whenever dogs have gotten loose and had sex with other dogs, you know, male mates with a female and they have a litter of puppies, that's a brand new species if they're two different species of dogs. They're breeds of dogs. I mean, hell, how do you think we got Labradoodles and Maltipoos and Golden Doodles? <laughs> they went, gee, I wonder... <laughs> Let's take this standard poodle and mate it with that golden retriever and see what happens. Or let's take that Labrador retriever and mate it with the standard poodle. It depends on which one's the male and which one's the female. I I've seen mutts, dogs that have, you know, multiple parents because, you know, one had sex with one, then had sex with another, and then had sex with another, and had sex with another. And you get a mutt, you know, what they call a Heinz 57. It it's, doesn't have a distinct breed. It's its own unique breed at that point. We have had so many hundreds of thousands of breeds of dogs in the world. The American Kennel Club only keeps track of the ones that a breeder certifies with the American Kennel Club. That's it. Anything else is fair game. And, and you want to say that long ago and far away in Africa somewhere, there just happened to be one male, mitochondrial Eve, and one, or one sorry, Y chromosome Adam, one male, 
and one female mitochondrial Eve, and they happened to be in the same place at the same time, and somehow, and as if by magic, they created the, the, the human race. After some magical extinction-level event that no one has any record of anywhere on the planet. They can't even link it to the last Ice Age. Because the Ice Age was like 10,000 years ago, and they want to say, oh, this is like, uh, you know, 50 to 100,000 years ago. Do you see the lunacy? Oh, amazing. And um, one of my favorite studies that, that you just pointed to, Jay, uh, that, that says over 90% of all species have arisen at the same time. Yeah, because of again low levels of of genetic diversity. So, uh, some of the best evidence for for a literal Adam and Eve is where, it, in our genetics, we've yeah. literally discovered the the first couple. Wow, just wow! They really, really, really believe it, don't they? Yes, we do. Because we have a book that is ninety nine point nine percent true. Well, ninety nine percent true. The other 1% is stuff that we can't prove yet. But when you have something that is backed up by that much evidence, it lends a lot more credence to our theory of how the Earth got here, the flood, whereas your theory has been proven wrong time and time and time again. Their theory doesn't have a whole lot of water. It doesn't hold a lot of water. But it's the only theory they've got because the only other way that they could ever, ever try to prove beyond the, the shadow of a doubt or however you want to say it that something is going on is by just writing papers and then sending them out to all their colleagues so that their colleagues can go, yeah. That's all a peer-reviewed paper is. It's probably got more fiction than a local library. Now, is it backed up by actual science? Yes. But so are some fiction novels. Does that make them true? I mean, just because somebody put some documents in the French National Archives and then came back a few years later after they got yellowed and dusty and discovered them and wrote a book called Holy Blood, Holy Grail doesn't make it true, even though it's sitting in the nonfiction section because that was the basis for the Da Vinci Code. Le document secret. Oh, really? You just happen to find those one documents in a sea of supposed other documents. You just happen to find something called le document secret. Right. Son, it doesn't make it true. And trying to say that our genetic code today is the same as it was 4,400 years ago, 6,000 years ago, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 years ago is ludicrous. You don't know what it will look like. Hell, I don't even know what it looked like, but I'm betting it was a lot superior to our own. This is why I do this. Because we need to expose frauds like this. What do you guys think? Do you think that just six people populated the Earth? Let me know in the comments. Okay. Well, yes, I do believe that just six people off of Noah's Ark repopulated the Earth. 
after the Tower of Babel, of course. Okay? Because, yes, our languages also show a common root. And that's been shown before. That at one point, all of the languages were one language, and then at some point, they diverged. And then from that, we've gotten all of our modern languages. Again, like our different races and diversity, those languages evolved over time. And I only use that term because that's what happened to us humans. That's why we have different races. We're still human beings. Fundamentally, you have a brain, two eyes, a nose, a mouth, a pair of lungs, an esophagus, a trachea, a stomach, a liver, a spleen, a digestive tract, some sort of sex organ, be you male or female, okay, and a waist chute. You have two arms, two legs, two hands, ten fingers, ten toes. You have the same muscle structure as me. Now, granted, some people may have lost some things along the way due to unforeseen circumstances. But when you popped out of your mom, most of the time, probably about 99.9999995% of the time, you had everything I just named off. Oh, and a central nervous system with a backbone and a rib cage. And a skeleton. An endoskeleton, by the way, that means inside. Exoskeleton means outside. Fundamentally, you are the same as me. The only difference is phenotypical. And what that means is, is that the differences are cosmetic. Differences in melanin concentration and bone structure and a little bit of muscle structure, okay? In terms of fast twitch versus slow twitch, um, you know, your, your strength that you can lift and that kind of stuff, okay? That's it. And hair color. But those are the only differences... But those are the differences that most people look at. Because they're all, you can see them. Because my melanin concentration isn't that much. Some people have more, some people have less. Lesser part of the population have less. Mostly because those are the people that that have albinism or albinos we call them albinos okay where they can't spend a lot of time out in the sun because they will absolutely get fried like third degree burn fried like they will absolutely get wrecked in the sun i can get wrecked in the sun if i sit out too long okay but a person from africa can sit out in the sun for much longer, granted, they will have issues, but not as much as I will have. If we sat out in the sun for an hour, okay, I can guarantee you when we get back in, my skin's going to be red, their skin's going to hardly even change a shade. Okay? And there's varying degrees of that due to latitude and how much protection people used during their time in the sun over generations okay that's why people that characteristically live in this part of the world are not as dark as people that live in this part of the world why because the people that live in this part of the world had animals. They sheared those animals, they spun cloth, and they put it over their heads and faces. So, did they get 
darker? Yes, but they didn't get as dark because they didn't spend as much time out in the sun. Because they covered themselves up. Okay? Whereas the tribes that live in Central Africa, they went the opposite route. They didn't wear much clothing. And in some cases, some tribes wear barely any clothing at all. And so, yeah, their, their skin, they have a lot of melanin to protect against that. Okay? Whereas the people that live in the extreme northern latitudes and the extreme southern latitudes, and I'm saying that, you know, because it's mostly the extreme northern latitudes, because in the extreme southern latitudes, we sent a lot of our criminals there. <laughs> Okay. Or they live in mountainous regions, that kind of stuff, where they don't get as much sun. Okay? Their melanin concentration is pretty low. I know. Because I live in a northern latitude. We have four seasons. And during the summertime, when I wear my t shirts, okay, probably doesn't show that much on here. Okay, I I get I get tan, I get a little brown on my arms. But if I were to pull my shirt up, I'd blind you. So I'm not going to do that. Okay. Like the Weird Al Yankovic song says, "White and nerdy." Okay. I'm nerdy in the extreme, whiter than sour cream. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it's like, I used to tell people when we used to play shirts and skins, I'm like, you don't want me playing skins. Because if I take my shirt off, I'm going to blind y'all. And some people were like, yeah, we want them on skins because we want to blind everybody. <laughs> okay. I didn't like taking my shirt off because, yeah, I'm white. Okay. And, yeah, I got a massive second degree burn on my shoulders one time. Okay, from swimming without a shirt on in the pool. And it sucked for like two days until I took a shower and got all the chlorine out of it. And then, you know, kind of, and then and I had this beautiful golden brown tan and then it all peeled away. <laughs> that was a long time ago. But that's the point. Okay. Here again, fundamentally, inside all the same. We have the same skeletal structure, we have the same muscle structure, we have the same amount of organs. We all create hair. Some more than others. But we all do it. That's why. Okay. Because when they started out their genetic code was such that they didn't have to worry about that. And that's why they could do that. But that's what you're going to have to believe in if you believe that there was one homo sapien male, Y chromosome Adam, and one homo sapien female, mitochondrial Eve, on the continent of Africa that, that were at the same time, in the same place, somehow and as if by magic, and they were able to mate. Because the only way that works under natural selection is that the new has to take over and the old has to die off. How does the old die off? Well, the new has to populate the earth and force out the old. Right? Isn't that what natural selection is? So Homo Neanderthalus and Homo erectus had to die out at some point for Homo sapiens to take over. But it's funny because Homo erectus and Homo neanderthalus are actually just humans. They actually have a human genetic DNA code. It's virtually identical to ours. So... That just means that they're us. But anyway, smash that like button, hit subscribe, drop a comment below, let me know what you thought of this series. Um... Just a brief two video series here. Um, I know I've been going for about an hour and a half now, but I just wanted to make sure that I got this video done. Okay? 
So I'm sorry it took so long, but I wanted to make sure that I pounded this point home. <coughs> that our genetic diversity has nothing to do with what people like him say it does. Okay? Has everything to do with this. Okay? And as we say, we will see you on the next one.